In this video, I'll be rebuilding the torque tube on a late model Porsche 944 using a set of super bearings from Black Sea R&D. While working to replace the clutch on this 944, I noticed that the torque tube bearings were showing some signs of wear, which is relatively common to see as these cars age. When the bearings start to fail, you'll generally get irregular vibrations or noises from the driveline under operation, such as a rhythmic squealing sound below the car when idling and at very low speeds. To summarize the torque tube removal process, you'll first need to remove the lower exhaust system as well as the transaxle after disconnecting the CV axles, the shifter linkage, and the wiring. The shift lever inside the car needs to be removed as well, along with the shift linkage running back to the transaxle, and then the torque tube unbolted from the clutch housing. The final obstacle involves lowering the rear suspension on the car to create space for the torque tube to be fully removed. In simple terms, lowering the rear suspension can be achieved by removing 8 to 10 bolts from the various suspension components. However, in order to lower the assembly far enough, the rear brake sensor connectors as well as the brake fluid lines will need to be disconnected, so be prepared to bleed the brakes upon reassembly. The rear suspension features a cross tube running the width of the car, inside of which are two torsion bars. Connected to the tube on each side is an aluminum bearing flange, a rear axle strut that acts as a torsion bar spring plate, and a rear axle trailing arm. After removing the lower bolt for the rear shocks, the trailing arms can be dropped down slightly and supported with blocks or jack stands from below. The remaining connection points consist of a 13mm nut and bolt setup at the upper cross tube bracket, the one 17mm nut or the two 17mm bolts at the rear bearing flange bracket, either way, and the 19mm bolt that secures the lower bearing flange to the chassis. One item of note is that the torque tube can be removed by lowering only one half of the suspension as shown here, where all the aforementioned bolts have been removed with the exception of the 19mm bearing flange bolt on one side. Since this is a later car, we'll also need to remove the aluminum support bracket that sits just in front of the cross tube, where it's secured by four 17mm bolts. It also makes things easier to remove the rear exhaust heat shield, the center heat shield and its rear bracket, as well as the foam shifter insulation. With all the bolts removed, some pry bar work can be applied to the various brackets to break the suspension free from the chassis, and then the entire assembly can be lowered to the ground. Once the suspension is lowered about 8 inches, the torque tube can be pulled back and tilted downward to fully extract it from the rear of the car, and then the rebuild process can begin. To dismantle the torque tube, the following list of supplies will be needed. A 6 foot length of standard black or galvanized 1 half inch steel plumbing pipe. A 6 foot length of 3 quarter inch 10 TPI threaded rod. 5 3 quarter inch 10 TPI nuts. Two thick flat washers that will fit inside the internal diameter of the tube at 3 inches and reasonably close to the outer diameter of the 3 quarter inch threaded rod. Two 3 quarter inch standard flat washers and a flat bar or plate of steel with a one inch hole in it. For this, I used a one inch iron floor flange. I was able to find all these items at my local Lowe's home improvement store and it ended up being about $100 worth of supplies. Now that the torque tube has been removed from the car and the list of supplies acquired, we can begin the teardown process, which involves hammering out the drive shaft and extracting the old bearings as outlined in the technical article featured on Clark's Garage. To support and protect the components during this process, I built a wooden jig to hold the torque tube so that it could be hammered and wrenched upon with precision while replacing the bearings. I figured if the tube was really locked down in place, it would reduce the risk of damaging the parts or myself in the process. The transaxle end is bolted to the jig and the clutch end is boxed in with 2x4s. The jig has some longer outriggers on one end that can be braced against a wall or another immovable object for hammering and pushing the drive shaft in and out. You can also use a large workbench or a set of sawhorses to support the material while working through the rebuild. Before the drive shaft is removed from the tube, we'll first measure the distance from the transaxle end of the drive shaft to the bell housing end of the tube and record it. This is so the drive shaft can later be reinstalled to the correct depth inside the torque tube. I also measured the engine end of the shaft from the front of the tube flange and recorded it, and in this case, the front of the shaft was protruding 5 and 13 16 inches from the tube flange, and the rear of the shaft was recessed 1 16 inch from the tube edge. We're now ready to remove the drive shaft using the 6 foot length of half inch plumbing pipe and a large hammer. Because the threaded end of the pipe had a slightly tapered internal diameter, it wouldn't easily fit over the clutch end of the shaft, so I first cut off the end of the pipe using a grinding wheel for a cleaner fitment. To begin, slide one end of the pipe over the pilot diameter at the front of the drive shaft, and then support the other end of the pipe so that the angle of force is aligned with the shaft. Next, use a large hammer to pound the shaft out towards the bell housing side of the torque tube with some well-placed medium-forced hammer blows. Since the steel plumbing pipe is relatively soft, it won't damage the heat-treated drive shaft. And with some repetitive strikes, the shaft will gradually work its way through the tube, getting easier as it passes through each of the bearings. Once the shaft clears the final bearing, it can be removed and set aside. This is a good time to inspect the overall condition of the drive shaft to determine if it needs to be replaced. Check the splined areas at both ends of the shaft where they should be straight and free of damage. 
Moderate surface oxidation can be cleaned up with a wire brush. The shaft itself should also be straight and free of any bends, where it can be rolled on a clean flat surface to check for inconsistencies. Delamination of the bearing inserts can also cause damage to the drive shaft, so it's a good idea to inspect the areas where the bearings were placed and ensure the shaft's coating hasn't been excessively burnished. Finally, the front pilot nub is a common failure point on the 944 drive shaft, where it fits into the pilot bearing at the back of the crankshaft. This holds the drive shaft in place and prevents it from vibrating under operation within the clutch, so it's important that it falls within the specification. To test the nub, take a new pilot bearing and place it on the end of the shaft, where it should be snug and free of looseness. The looser it feels, the more the drive shaft will vibrate under operation. With the drive shaft removed from the torque tube, it's time to turn our attention back to the set of tools needed to extract the bearings. As for a process overview, we'll need the 6-foot threaded steel rod, the 5 nuts, the large washers, the steel plate, and a couple wrenches with a 1 and 1 8 inch fitting. On one side of the rod, a few large washers will be installed, followed by the two nuts, and then the nuts tighten down against each other to hold the washers in place. This portion of the assembly will be used to pull the bearings from the tube. After the rod is inserted into the tube, the metal plate, a washer, and a nut will be installed on the opposite end of the rod, followed by the last two nuts, again locked against each other so that the rod can be turned. If you think of the rod as a bolt threaded into the tube, the rod is turned in a counterclockwise direction to loosen it, thereby pulling the washer assembly through the length of the tube to collect all the bearings. Alternatively, the rod can be held in place while the nut is turned in a clockwise direction to achieve the same result. Now that we know how the assembly works, it's time to apply some grease to the entire length of the threaded rod, which will prevent the threads from stripping as the rod is turned. Next, the rod with the washers installed on one end can be inserted into the transaxle end of the tube, where it passes through the center of each of the four bearings and out the other side. On the clutch end, the steel plate with the one inch hole, the large washer, and the drawing nut are installed, threading the nut down against the washer and plate. Again, the two jam nuts go on last at the end of the rod where they're tightened down to lock them in place. With everything assembled, one wrench holds the drawing nut in a fixed position while the rod is turned. The threaded rod has to travel a distance of approximately 68 inches to fully remove the bearings, and for each 360 degree rotation, the rod only travels about an eighth of an inch, so it takes roughly 544 full rotations to extract the bearings. If you're using a ratchet where each tool movement covers anywhere from a quarter turn to a half turn, you're easily looking at over a thousand individual tool actuations to cover the distance. To speed up the process, I used a cordless drill on the high torque setting to get some movement on the first bearing, but once the rod picked up the second bearing, it was too much force for the drill to handle. You may be tempted to use an impact wrench here, but there is risk of stripping the threaded rod without approach, so I switched back to manual movements. In all, the bearing extraction should take about an hour, with a few breaks in between wrenching sessions. As the bearings reach the clutch end of the tube, they'll end up hitting the metal plate, after which point the single nut can be loosened and some spacers installed between the plate and the tube flange to fully clear the bearings. And with a few final turns, the disassembly will be complete. Here's a look at the two bearings side by side. The factory bearing is obviously quite a bit smaller than the super bearing. The housing on the super bearing provides a larger surface area of rubber exterior, which secures the bearing unit in place and isolates more driveline vibrations than the original bearings. The internal bearing is also larger and can handle more load than the factory bearing. And the super bearing features a larger insert to better support the drive shaft, where the increased rubber surface absorbs driveline vibrations caused by the shaft under operation. As we look to the rebuild process, the following supplies will be required. All the parts used for disassembly, in addition to a large rubber mallet or a plastic dead blow hammer, a 22 millimeter or a 15 16 inch socket, a tape measure, simple green or a similar liquid degreaser, a can of brake cleaner, a can of WD-40, some shop towels, the installation lubricant, protective disc, and diagram as supplied by Black Sea R&D, protective eyewear and nitrile gloves, a can of black semi-gloss paint for metal, a roll of duct tape, and a set of sawhorses or equivalent. Step 1. The torque tube and drive shaft should be examined for any damage before rebuilding. If damage to the torque tube housing is observed, it should be corrected after disassembly or replaced. The drive shaft should also be closely examined for any fractures or excessively rusted areas, especially around the spline sections. If any damage to the shaft is found, it should be replaced before reassembly into the torque tube. Step 2. The interior of the torque tube needs to be cleaned using Simple Green or a similar spray degreaser, a can of brake cleaning spray, and some shop towels. After spraying a liberal amount of liquid degreaser into the torque tube, some towels wadded up to fill the internal diameter of the tube can be pushed through using a long rod. It'll take a few passes to completely clean the tube of any residual grease. Next, continue with the brake cleaning spray and some more towels after the heavy grease residue has been removed. The tube's interior is considered clean when a shop towel soaked with brake cleaning spray comes out clean after being passed through the tube.
Once the torque tube is cleaned out, visually inspect the interior for any rust or damage. The tube should be free of any rust and the interior wall should appear clean. With the torque tube cleaned out, next spray some WD-40 into the tube and use some paper towels to coat the interior surfaces, making sure the walls have a light coat of WD-40 on them. This will ease the installation of the super bearings using the threaded rod method of pulling them into the tube. And now that the tube is cleaned out and lightly lubricated, it's ready for super bearing installation. Step 3. Remove the super bearing units from their packaging and examine them to become familiar with their internal structure. All of the new bearing units need to be placed into the torque tube facing the same direction to ensure a trouble-free installation of the drive shaft. The internal bearing housing has a shoulder on one side, which is the bearing stop, and a clearly visible steel circlip. This side also features a thicker support wall. The other side has a steel spiral lock around the inner circumference, which locks the bearing inside the new unit. This side features a thinner support wall, and it's this thinner walled spiral lock side of the bearing that should be placed into the torque tube facing the engine end, with the thicker walled shoulder side facing the transaxle end. Here's a look at the two different bearing ends side by side for comparison. Step 4. Modify the white plastic installation bushing by drilling a hole in its center so that the threaded rod being used to pull the super bearings into place can be placed through it. I used a 3 quarter inch hole saw to create a hole with the same diameter as the rod. After the plastic bushing is installed on the rod, a metal fender washer should be placed behind the bushing to protect it from the jam nuts that will be locked down and used to set the bearings to their correct positions. It's recommended to first install the three super bearings at the transaxle side of the shifter holes, bearing numbers 2, 3, and 4, and then pull the front super bearing, bearing number 1, into place last. It's both safe and acceptable to install the bearings from either the engine end or the transaxle end of the torque tube to reduce the travel distance of each bearing, so long as they are installed in the correct orientation with the thinner walled spiral lock side facing towards the engine end. For example, bearing number 2 is installed from the engine end past the two shifter bolt holes to a depth of 26.5 inches. Bearings 3 and 4 are then installed from the transaxle end to depths of 23 inches and 4 inches, respectively. And finally, bearing number 1 is installed from the engine end to a depth of 10 inches. As the super bearings are being placed at different depths, you should apply duct tape over the threaded rod portions that could come in contact with the inner rubber bushings so they'll be protected from damage. This includes the short portion at the end of the rod that will always be inside the super bearing as it's being installed. Step 5. Once you're ready to install the new bearings and the necessary items have been fabricated as shown, smear a light film of the supplied lubricant into the opening of the tube where you'll begin pulling in the super bearings. Spray some WD-40 on a towel and wipe down the outer rubber of the super bearing and place a smear of the supplied lube into the inner rubber bushing of the bearing to help with the drive shaft installation later. Then using a rubber mallet or a plastic hammer, tap the super bearing into the tube end enough to hold it in place so the threaded rod can be placed through it and attached with the plastic bushing against the bearing. Step 6. Prepare to draw the super bearings into their correct positions as shown in the supplied diagram. The threaded rod should again be coated with lubricant, WD-40, or light grease to help it move through the drawing nut more easily. With the threaded rod and the bearing in place for installation, reapply the steel plate, the large washer, the drawing nut, and the jam nuts on the other end of the assembly. It's now time to begin the work of pulling each bearing into the tube by turning the threaded rod. This will be a slow process and care should be taken to ensure the threaded rod is centered within the super bearings. Stop periodically to take depth measurements from the other end of the tube and continue as needed, taking account to subtract for the one half inch thickness of the plastic disc from your measurements. For example, when installing bearing number two at a depth of 26 and a half inches, a measurement of 26 inches with the disc in place means that the bearing has reached its appropriate depth of 26 and a half inches. This procedure should be used for all three super bearings aft of the shifter holes towards the transaxle end. Step seven, when placing the front super bearing into the engine end of the torque tube, no additional lubricant outside the WD-40 wipe down on the outer body should be placed on it or the front of the tube. This is so the front super bearing won't move when initially placing the drive shaft through it when angulation of the drive shaft is most problematic. Once a drive shaft has passed through the second super bearing, the shaft can be depressed with little concern of further angulation, which can drag the super bearings from their positions. Step 8. Once all four super bearings are placed into the torque tube, let them rest for a period of 24 hours. Your attention should now turn back to the drive shaft, and after examining the shaft for any damage and ensuring the end nub is within specification using new pilot bearing, thoroughly degrease the shaft. This should include the splines at each end using a handheld wire brush to remove the old grease from between the splines. If any rust is observed, remove it with a wire brush as well. Degrease the shaft a second time and wipe it down to prepare it for a few light coats of black semi-gloss paint. The paint will add corrosion prevention to the drive shaft as well as create a slicker surface for its installation into the super bearings. Taping a clean edge at the splined ends will give the drive shaft a more professional look, and let the drive shaft dry the recommended length of time. Step 9. 
Once you're ready to begin the drive shaft installation, use a press or a plastic hammer in a 22 millimeter or 15 16 inch socket to press out the bearing insert from one of the factory bearings. A larger socket or a spacer placed below the bearing unit will support it and allow for the insert to be pressed out of the bearing. After the insert is removed, tap the Porsche bearing unit into the engine side of the torque tube just far enough to hold it in place but with most of it still showing so that it can be easily removed later. This bearing unit will be used as a stop for the drive shaft from being pushed through the tube at too severe an angle, which could potentially damage the super bearing or move the first two from their positions. Step 10. Position the torque tube at an angle with the transaxle end towards the floor and the flange braced against a wall or another movable object, using a folded towel to protect the flange from damage. The engine end should be supported on a sawhorse or equivalent and the tube should be angled up approximately 30 to 45 degrees from the floor. The engine side should be hooked over the sawhorse. Make sure the aluminum flange is pressed firmly against the corner of the floor and wall so that it won't travel while installing the drive shaft into the torque tube. Step 11. Apply a generous amount of the supplied lubricant to the splined area of the transaxle end of the drive shaft, as well as to the shaft itself. Insert the transaxle end of the shaft through the Porsche bearing unit at the engine end of the tube and carefully place it into the first super bearing insert, applying constant pressure until the spline portion is pushed through. Continue pressing through to the second super bearing, using care to ensure the drive shaft is being pressed straight through the center of each bearing insert. The super bearing inserts were designed to allow the shaft to be pushed through them with constant pressure on the shaft using body weight. Hammering the shaft through the bearing inserts can damage them and is therefore not recommended. Step 12. The final placement of the drive shaft must fall within a specific distance at the rear of the torque tube so the torque coupler can be attached to the drive shafts at their appropriate connection points. The clamping bolt indentation at the end of the drive shaft should be centered in the rear access hole on the flange with the exact positioning set by using the measurements taken prior to disassembly. Once the drive shaft is through the last bearing at the transmission end, some careful taps with a plastic dead blow hammer can be used to set the drive shaft to its proper depth. As a side note, when securing the torque coupler between the torque tube and the transaxle, Porsche's high pressure grease part number 000043-30573 should be applied to the splines of both shafts to prevent premature corrosion and spline fretting. It's also recommended to install two new Porsche sourced clamping bolts and torque them to a value of 80 newton meters or 58 foot pounds. Well, if you've been following along and have completed this work yourself, congratulations on upgrading the performance and reliability of your 944. If you're in need of some torque tube repairs and you'd rather not perform this work yourself, Black Sea R&D does offer a rebuild service that's worth checking out. I'll also add that their service response, expert recommendations, and clear instructions have been top-notch throughout this entire process. So anyway, that concludes the Porsche 944 torque tube rebuild tutorial using the super bearings from Black Sea R&D.